This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, bingo, if you didn't know it, it's Friday. Yes, it is Friday, and you know, we, there's no fake news there, it's really Friday. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel, this is Think Tech, and this is what, Think Tech Asia we're doing today, and with our special guest, uh, Michael Davis. Michael Davis is uh, in faculty at um, Jindal University in India. He's also um, a senior fellow at Hong Kong University and at Notre Dame right now today as we speak. He's like a, a three-legged stool all over the that's world. That's right, that's right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the last time we, uh, we met was a couple weeks ago, yeah. and I was so happy to talk to you. And again, um, we talked about human rights in Hong Kong and, yeah. and how this is all evolving you know, after the, the, the turnover um, and how you know, China is playing the game and how Hong Kong yeah. is reacting and what that means on the world stage. Since we spoke, um, two things have come across my bow, and I want to mention yeah. them to you yeah. and see see your thoughts. Yeah. One is we had sort of a mm, disagreement among two uh, guests who were on the show. Uh, one found uh, a news article in the China News, which China is China Daily. China Daily, which is a, yeah. uh, a newspaper uh, run by the yeah, you know, an English language newspaper run by Beijing the Beijing government, government yeah. Yeah. Uh, English language, um, to the effect that um, that th there had been a shift in policy on mm -hmm. in migration in China, and yeah. now they wanted to see people come in. They wanted yeah. to offer them. Visas, you know, extended visas. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know about permanent residence, but long-term visas, and yeah. and be easier on them to let them live and work and play in China um, on a more open basis. Yeah. We had another guest come on and says that's really not true. Yeah. That's not true at all. Then I want to add one more fuel to the fire here. Yesterday, uh, Richard uh, Hornick, um, who was a journalist in China for a long time and now teaches things Chinese at Stony Brook in the State University of New York. Um, was out here, he comes out here, and he speaks to the um, Friends of the East-West Center, that is the China Seminar, meets yeah. every month. Yeah. And his, his talk was really interesting to me. Um, it, sort of, um, it sort of deals with that same issue, and what he said was that Xi Jinping, especially Xi Jinping, the last mm, four or five years, has been focused not so much on corruption, that was an earlier phase, yeah. Um, but on mind control, and he wants to control what you see on the internet, what you write, what you talk, think, right. teach at the universities. Right. And if you don't follow the party line, you're in trouble. Yeah. Um, he is trying to shape the thinking in China. Um, and wow, that was chilling to hear him yeah. talk about that. Right. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that Xi Jinping has become known to be sort of a hardliner on human rights. He's arrested, as we know, many reports have been uh, put out about uh, lawyers being arrested. So so there was the, this e evolution where street activists, people basically whose land was confiscated and so on, were protesting, uh, and then they would get arrested, and the lawyers would come in, uh, uh, often from Beijing, come into the rural communities somewhere and represent them and so on. And it seemed that, you know, that wasn't what the government wanted. So then they started going after the lawyers as well, the lawyers that were representing people. And the lawyers were accused of, of fomenting street protests and so on in conjunction with cases and, and so on. Many of them fled into exile and the rest are in jail or bit put in and out of jail. Uh, and, and so Xi Jinping, and then at the same time, he's trying to control the Internet. Uh, so pass new laws that regulate the internet and in effect make people responsible for what goes up on the internet and, and make the companies that, that run internet uh, the sites to, to uh, register and so on. Uh, and then of course the, the, the public media has never been free, it's run by the government. Uh, and so, yeah, in a sense, then, and you know, universities now have come under more and more attack and more and more intense pressure. Uh, it's interesting, uh, several years ago, there was something called Document Number no. 9, where university professors were forbidden to teach liberal constitutionalism and human rights, a topic very familiar to me. <laughs> and so I would, as a professor in Hong Kong, I would tell my students, you know, this class, uh, you, you can decide whether you want to stay in it or not, but I can tell you that, that what I'm teaching here would be illegal, uh, you know, 10 miles away. You know, uh, so and there would be sanctions. Yeah, that court you would be picked up and arrested. That course on was on constitutionalism in emerging states, it was essentially what the government was telling <laughs> professors they couldn't teach. 
Uh, now, Chinese professors are... This is exactly what you and I talked about last time. <laughs> right, yeah. Chinese professors are all dedicated, and many of them are, and want to teach things that are important and critical thinking and so on for their students. Uh, and many of them find ways to get around these hurdles and try to, you know, gently com come into subjects and so on. But it's very difficult for them, and many of them have gotten into trouble. Uh, the easy move is to push them into a university somewhere off in Xinjiang or somewhere in an obscure area, uh, alternatively to, to just fire them outright. Uh, and so they get into trouble, and some of them flee into exile, uh, and so on. So, so the, wherever people are thinking or expected to think, the idea seems to be that they not be exposed to anything critical of the government and that everything be in effect supportive of the regime. And so this raises the question in communities at large and among scholars, you know, uh, well, Chinese people, opinion surveys say they don't care about human rights, they just want to make money and so on. But how do you gauge a society's views on subjects like free speech and so on if they don't have it? Is, can we just credit, you know, they've been all repressed, they're not allowed to speak, they're not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that. But if we ask them, oh, we just want to make money and leave us alone, is that a, an accurate measure of what people want in that society? So does that leave us free to say, well, Chinese are happy with this kind of government, so we shouldn't criticize it or we should just get along with China and not pay attention. And, and our political leaders, we would say, shouldn't bring up human rights because the Chinese people don't care. But I don't think that you can really judge a society's views on something if there's not any space for discussion of it. Yeah, and you also can't find the potential of the society. In, in, right. I mean, I think the fundamental point is that um, if you have free speech, if you have the right of expression, mm -hmm. uh, you have a better economy, ultimately. You have people expressing themselves innovating, creating, all that entrepreneurial kinds of things. And if you don't if you don't have free speech, you don't get there. So if you don't get there, how do you know what you're missing is the problem? Yeah, yeah I, it's interesting. I've written a number of articles over the years on what I call the political economy of human rights. On, yeah, yeah. In effect, why human rights matters. And one of the, the, the arguments in the past against sort of guys who promote human rights is, look, authoritarian developmentalism worked in Asia. Korea became rich. Taiwan became rich and so on. These countries uh, earlier on, Thailand and so on. So they all succeeded uh, with rapid uh, growth and China as well. I mean, they call it the economic miracle. But my argument was that authoritarianism of this type becomes its own grave digger that it works to a point, and, and, and I think Amartya Sen would agree with this, the Nobel laureate in economics who has spoken on these issues as well, that, that to a point maybe a government that can just keep chaos at bay will, and, and that wants to support the production of cheap goods uh, that are, you know, don't take a lot of talent or skills, can succeed. And, and the economic growth can be rapid. If you're really impoverished, having a, a, a double-digit growth rate is not that hard. It's almost any growth is going to be a double-digit yeah. growth rate. As the economy becomes richer, uh, then uh, sustaining 2 3% would be extraordinary, right? It's something the United States is trying to do right now. And, and so uh, this, I would argue, at, at a certain point, it becomes hard to go to the next stage of development. There's, they call it a middle income trap, that they get stuck there and they can't go forward. And of course, e e economics is not a precise science, so we, we, we hope this, these are theories and arguments that people make. But in, in the cases of, of the countries that I was looking at at the time when I was writing these articles, South Korea, Taiwan, and so on, you know, it's not that some uh, professor sits back and says, now you have to change if you want to succeed. The people on the street say that. You know, when people start becoming half free, if you will, yeah. and have more and more wealth yeah. and ability to do what they want, they want to be free and left alone to do what they want. And if governments can't deliver that, then they start objecting. So a couple of years ago, there was an argument, will China defy gravity? Is, is this gravity would say that this will happen, that, that as the country becomes, reaches a certain level of development, the public will demand more and more uh, democratic institutions. 
And, and of course, the U.S. bet on that. Uh, for years, supporting bringing China into the World Trade Organization, everything, was betting that China would follow this pattern as well, and we would see reform, and the Communist Party has dug in its heels. And this is where the first part of your, your first question intersects with the second. Xi Jinping, uh, we all see China as a rich place, and why, what are they whining about? They're doing okay. But Xi Jinping sees the government as insecure. He, he's afraid that exactly what I just described and what your question- Is that a legitimate fear? Yeah, is that yeah, a legitimate concern? I think it is a legitimate concern. So, so he's digging in his heels because his view is the Communist Party is the only thing that can keep China you know, orderly and safe and so on. And, and, and so uh, he doesn't want to move towards the kinds of reforms that would fundamentally change the system and call into question the power of the Communist Party. So this is the tension that's going on, and it goes on in other developmental contexts as well. It would strike me the miracle you talk about happened before you know, Xi Jinping, yeah. largely, right? Yeah, right. I mean, it started out, and, and it went on for 10 or 15 years, and it was a miracle every right. day watching it. And things were more open then, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Yeah? Now he's closing it down. Yeah. So query, you know, is, is, th is, is his, is the miracle his, or was the miracle something he inherited? And doing this, is, real, is it really necessary, or can the miracle do well without this kind of repression? Right, and this is the question you know, that, 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 that comes out of the analysis I just gave. Do you, you know, can, can they, is it that China's reaching that point? You know, maybe Jiang Zemin didn't have to worry about this because they were in the early stages of development and they could make lots of widgets and, and make money. But now they want to have high tech development, they want to be more independent, they want to be uh, more assertive militarily. Is all these th are all these things at risk if the Communist Party loses power? Does it then, as they fear, become yeah. a sort of system of chaos? Yeah. But my, my view is that clinging to power in some ways, I think, puts it more at risk. Yes. Because it causes a government to dig in its heels, in a sense, put itself at odds with, with the or natural sort of expectations of a, of a public in an evolving middle-level income economy that wants to be a first-tier economy. Could it be that his sense of <clears throat> manifest destiny, you know, not only stand up China, but stand up more, stand up tall, stand up right. globally. I mean, he's much more ambitious about that, seems to me, than his predecessors, right. uh, Hu Jintao, for example. So, you know, the, the question is, uh, is, this a, is there a linkage here? Uh, I am more ambitious, therefore I have to do more repression. Right, I, I think that's the case. And, and he, you know, they want to be the, the world's number one power. And they think this is the path to it, that they dig in their heels and they push their system of government, that their leadership would not be tolerated if, if they opened up the society. So it, it creates a paradox. As you become more economically uh, free, in a sense, people have their own money, they're not living in communes anymore in rural China, that they, they may demand more, so we need to control them more. And I think this is sort of the dynamic that's going on. Now, will it work? That's the question, will China defy gravity? Will, will they somehow pull this off? And, and it's tricky, but I suppose if you were trying to say what are their, their best chances, you know, how would you analyze it? Probably you would say, well, they're not a Ferdinand Marcos. They're not a one-man dictatorship. Historically, you would say that, and that the Communist Party yeah, in, is inclusive of a large sector of the elites in the society, and therefore maybe it can sort of satisfy these people and take away risk of, of overthrow. You know, the interesting thing is yeah. that in 1979 and thereabouts, it was the Cultural Revolution and all, yeah. um, if the people who were there in 1979 were running the show, they would be they would be troubled right. because they would see this as returning to a bad time. Right. Um, but they're not there. And right. what's there is the millennials. What's right. there is the guys who have a taste for consumer goods, right. who love their WeChat, who, who love all the automation around them right. and all these splendid things that have been built right. over the past 10 years. So they may not care. It's, it's a generational shift, isn't it? <clears throat> Well, yeah, and it's interesting. It occurs everywhere. It occurs in the United States and sure. the Western countries. It was interesting that uh, Foa and Monk, these two authors, wrote a piece last year in the Journal of Democracy where they looked at survey data around the Western world and they found that in Western developed countries, something like 17% 
of millennials think military rule would be better than democracy. <laughs> so, I mean, this explains why people vote the way they do, that there's a different views. Uh, where during the, the Cold War, uh, where communism was a direct threat, people were more conscious of, of the dangers of, of this kind of authoritarianism. So. That's Michael Davis. Uh -huh. uh, Michael Davis is in the faculty of uh, Jindal University in India, and he's a senior fellow at Hong Kong University, where he used to teach plenty. Uh, and uh, Notre Dame all at the same time, yeah, quite yeah. remarkable. And yeah. look at him, he's here with us now. <laughs> when we come back from this break, we're going to talk about how this affects One Belt, One Road, okay. how this affects um, India, for example, yeah. uh, how it affects the United States okay. uh, in terms of the changes in China around uh, uh, civil rights, rather human rights, and, uh, and freedom of speech. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's research in Manoa. Good afternoon. My name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii we show at 3 o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland, on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. Okay, Ni Hao Ma, again. <laughs> <laughs> also, Shin Yin Kwai La, that's early. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah, we're that's Michael Davis. There. And we're talking yes. about some yeah. pretty interesting things. We're talking about the change, uh, you know, the approach to First Amendment uh, freedom of expression in China under Hu Jintao, which seems to be actually accelerating in recent, yeah. recent months and years. And, you know, at the same time, we had this Manifest Destiny thing going on where he's trying to connect up with Europe, one belt, one road, yeah. um, trying to, you know, deliver and consolidate Chinese influence in a continent coming yeah. to you. Right. Um, and so the question is, you know, how does this affect that? If I'm in India, for example, this is a good place to begin, how do I see this? And Indians, uh, you know, are very happy with constitutional government. They're very happy with, uh, with human rights, uh, I think. And democracy in general, they're a success story in that regard. Right. Um, and so the question is, how do they see their big neighbor in the Northeast, uh, you know, as, as a greater threat because right. of this or what? Well, it's interesting. India is a great case, of course, is a sort of uh, test case of the, the, the reach of democracy. Uh, I, when I teach a course on this, I actually one week say, uh, will, China, uh, did, will China defy gravity? And the next week, uh, the heading is, did India defy gravity? <laughs> because gravity would tell us that if it's a very poor country, the chances of success at democracy may be very low. Uh -huh. You know, that it's, it's challenging to build a democracy with poverty. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of economic development uh, feeds a democracy better. Yeah. And India has succeeded at it, and I've always been stunned when the issues come up and Indian people are debating them so hotly, and there are a lot of issues now from beef bans to the treatment of women in India and all kinds of human rights issues. I, f I find that Indians uh, really are willing to defend their constitutional system. You know, they, I'm sure there's r plenty of room for cynicism, but, but for the most part, uh, somehow they've woven constitutionalism and democracy into Hinduism and, and India has a democracy, it, it's corrupt, it has all kinds of problems. Tumultuous. Yeah, it's very tumultuous. I always <laughs> feel like, because I spent a lot of time both in China and India, that India almost makes me think like China on speed. You know, it's just so much going on. Your mouth is a gap. Why, why not? Did I really see all this? Things, all it doesn't this. have the same kind of stability that Hu Jintao is establishing. Right. Yeah, that yeah the this Xi would make the Communist Party leaders extremely wary. And so there's this tension between the two countries that's sort of inherent in their uh, very fundamental political systems, but it's also inherent in the fact that they're neighbors. And, and of course, the tip, their neighbor borders are over. There's a controversy around the area of their borders, which is Tibet. 
Uh, and of course, the Dalai Lama, who I've had the pleasure of meeting a few times at his home in India, uh, is a very ardent supporter of India and appreciates the kindness. Of, he lived in India for a long time. Yeah, he's he? lived there since 1959. Yeah. Uh, and he, the Tibetan leadership in exile are, are very careful to always respect India in their, uh, in their uh, exchanges there. Uh, and so then there are some border disputes, which would would otherwise be Tibet uh, India border disputes have become Sino Indian border disputes because of yes. China's China occupation. Take over Tibet, yeah, yeah Tibet. Uh, and so all this is there. And then the One Belt One Road is trying to go around India and reach Sri Lanka and and uh, basically the whole region, uh, Central Asia region. Uh, there, China's in bed very much with Pakistan. Uh, and that's very controversial uh, and in threatening. India. Yeah, it's perceived as threatening. And in some ways, all of this sort of pushes India a bit more into the American orbit, although Indians don't really want to be in anyone's orbit. They, they want to be independent. They, they're yeah. based, they're very rich and in intense tradition of uh, sovereignty and independence. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, the current government is very much wanting to get along with the United States. But I, I, I've been to India about three times over the last uh, semester, and I'll be, two weeks from now, I'll be there for four months. But when I'm there, I'm always, there's, there's, they're very perplexed about the current US government. I mean, no one gets Trump. <laughs> and no so, so this, Not anybody I know, really. That's right. So this, I'm sorry, Mr. Trump, but this is uh, the f first question you get in any political discussion that I found myself in in India over over the past few months, uh, and uh, they, I guess that the attitude outside of the United States is maybe we can just ride this out, and and this guy will say enough to get himself in trouble and not stay in office. Uh, but he's he's a very perplexing individual for uh, can you rely on him for anything is kind of the way Indians look at it. So they don't, we should look at it the same yeah, way. <laughs> so there's a hesitance to build their their foreign policy too much around the United States. They're waiting him out. Yeah, right. So uh, just moving to the West a little bit, uh, Africa. We, yeah. we know that the One Belt, One Road, yeah. uh, it goes to Europe, but yeah. it also goes to Africa. Yeah. And uh, the you know Chinese have substantial influence in Africa. Yeah. It started out economically, but it has military bases now, and all this is going on. And I wonder if this affects um, you know the the chemistry, if you will, the political chemistry, um, the de democratic chemistry in Africa. Because if yeah. they if they have a lot of influence and they deliver the same message, uh, you know, is we are going to control what you think, and if you're outside the box. We're going to punish you in some way. Is that going to affect their approach to developing countries like in Africa? Yeah, I think the most developing countries, we don't even have to go as far as Africa, Southeast Asia is sure. a very good case. Sure. But th there's a similar dynamic in that China pours money. You know, uh, there's the whole thing, money can buy you, can't buy you love. Well, China has decided it can. <laughs> and uh, and so, so is the American political yeah. system, by the way. <laughs> so China's sort of, uh, you know, soft power uh, is not, it's not very good at soft power because uh, what it has to offer the global market, other than, you know, widgets and goods and machines, is, is not as attractive, say, as Hollywood. You know, it's, it's not, there's not that much interest. The fact that China's an authoritarian regime uh, makes soft power a difficult uh, item for them. And I think they sort of gave up on, I mean, they still have Confucius Institutes and all this in these countries and try to reach out in, in cultural ways. But for the most part, they realize that if they're invest, an investor, then it can buy them some love. And, and, and this creates a kind of dynamic, I guess, where these countries tend to hedge. They want the Chinese money, but at the same time, they want to preserve their own independence and not be dominated by China. So I think across Southeast Asia in particular, there'd be a lot of interest in the United States being remaining present and being reliable. The reliability part now is a bit under, under, yeah, under yeah, question. Yeah. But in Africa, I think it gets down to uh, you know, because the Chinese One Belt, One Road initiative often involves debt. It's not just giving money away, it's lending money. And, and so uh, these countries have, you know, a, a current, a, in a democracy, you ask, 
her elected leader has to deliver something. So delivering a new airport, delivering new buildings, highways, and so on is good for, for the guy. But at the same time, along with it comes debt. I mean, China's famous for building infrastructure where none is needed. You know, they build cities that no one lives in. And in Africa, they may build things, offer things that political leaders who want to win elections might like uh, to have. But then along with it comes these debt obligations. And I think a lot of pushback from the societies because often the Chinese investments come with Chinese workers and, and maybe not enough employment opportunities yeah, and, for locals. And if I'm your creditor, I have leverage over you. I have influence right. over you. Uh, right. <clears throat> if I can you know, call my notes, so to speak, I can put lots of pressure on you right. economically and politically. And so if you're thinking outside of my box, I suppose the same notion about don't don't talk China down. Yeah. If you talk China down, we're going to find a way to pull a rug out from under you. Right. I think that yeah, there's an implicit threat there, and and so people will try to hedge in dealing with China. So it, it becomes almost a kind of colonialism. Yeah. It has many of the sort of mercantilist feel of the European colonialism. And all that considered, Michael. All of that considered. Let's return for a moment to a place where you spent a good part of your life, yeah. Hong Kong. Yeah. And let's visit, you know, the umbrella movement and people, you know, I mean, I remember how impressed I always was to find out that Hong Kong had retained freedom of speech. Yeah. It seems that freedom of speech is, um, you know, like threatened now yeah. because of what's going on in mainland China. You know, ultimately, the Chinese own Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, and they're going to, they have a long plan on Hong Kong and that yeah. long plan does not include a lot of freedom of speech, I think. Don't, right. don't you agree? Well, I think, yeah, what we've seen under Xi is, is they, they've tightened the screws, as it were. It was, I think, the first, uh, you know, well, 1997 handover up until 2010, 2012, something like this. The general view was to leave Hong Kong alone, just uh, let it take care of business. Uh, uh, things happened along the way. There were massive protests over national security laws in 2003 and 4. I was one of the, the uh, lawyer uh, scholars involved in, in uh, that uh, movement. And then uh, China says, oh, well, maybe these youngsters don't, uh, aren't, many of those protesters for young people, they, they don't understand China enough, so let's have patriotic education. And then that caused another <laughs> pushback and protest on the streets, and, and that was shelved. Uh, and, and then the uh, Hong Kong people kept pushing for democracy because they fear the Chinese government will interfere more and more in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong's autonomy will be lost. Hong Kong's autonomy in the Hong Kong mind equals the rule of law. And that means China doesn't have the rule of law. So the fundamental, if you do public opinion surveys in Hong Kong, the most core value of all is the rule of law. And everyone understands that that's, you know, when it comes to human rights, the rule of law is the most important instrument. And implicit in that is, right. is freedom of speech. Right, and free speech. And so, so those, that, that package of core values seems to be under threat. So the Chinese didn't like what the youth were doing, so they tightened the screws more. Then they started attacking our universities. They, they have ways of attacking the media by defunding, not supporting advertising for press that criticize China, not allowing reporters from, say, the Apple Daily, a very pro-democracy newspaper, to even go into China as reporters. Uh, and so they, they have all that. And then they have a united front tactics to reward their supporters in Hong Kong, which are business elites who want to do business in China, then go, you know, you have to go along to get along. And, and they, they are rewarded. So, and then they started attacking the universities. And it came up in very concrete ways. Uh, one of the dean who was with me, the two academics in the Article 23 Concern Group was Johannes Chan and myself. Johannes Chan was up for promotion to a higher position in the university. The Chinese-owned uh, press started attacking him. And so all these attacks were made, and then they tried to control the university council. And even though the, the independent committee that was evaluating candidates chose him, uh, the council overrode that under all this pressure from China because Johannes Chan was viewed as a kind of pro-democracy figure, and he shouldn't be given a high position in the University of Hong Kong. So these, uh, there's all these kinds of things going on. 
And then after Article 23 movement, uh, democracy is frozen, the idea of democracy, so Beijing's people run the government, and these government officials are made more and more subordinate, so that nowadays many people feel, in the old days, what we call the Western District, that's where the offices of Beijing are in Hong Kong, the Western District of Hong Kong Island. We used to say the Western, you know, most protests wouldn't waste time on the Western District, they'd go to government house. Not anymore. Most of the protests now go to Western District because <laughs> Western District is now viewed as a kind of shadow government telling the appointed Hong Kong government what to do. And in all of this, there's still a free press. I mean, it comes under various kinds of pressures I've mentioned, and even some editors were beaten up by thugs, you know, on the street. But uh, still there's a free press, and so this Hong Kong government somehow has to, it can't go too far. If it looks like, I mean, it's now it has gone too far practically. It's, it looks very submissive to Beijing, but somehow they have to pretend they're not and they have to. You know, just one last question, Michael. I mean, where does this go? It sounds to me like Beijing has a, a multi-pronged full court press on this issue as they did before, except yeah. they haven't forgotten. And the generations will change and the economies will change. Yeah. and. You know, the global history and all that will change. It's a, a, a it's a kaleidoscopic uh, observation. Yeah. And so I'm I'm really wondering if we look five years or ten years into the future, we find that as far as freedom of the press is concerned, it works the same way in Hong Kong as it does now in Beijing. Don't you think? Well, this is the danger, and and I you know I didn't mention that what they the latest move has been to make sure that these activists are arrested and sentenced to jail. And there's a case right now before the Supreme Court of the three young leaders who were, you know, Time Magazine covers, and I mean, I forget which may, I think Time had a cover on them, Joshua Wong. So these lead guys were all put in jail. So activists are now getting a strong message that they're going to be prosecuted and sent to jail. So this certainly has a chilling effect on being outspoken sure. in this society. And a lot of, you know, the cynics in Hong Kong feel that Hong Kong is dead already, that pretty much this vibrant, the most vibrant city in the world, number one ranking Freedom Forum, number one ranking on the rule of law, all these rankings have gone down now. And this extraordinary city, this New York of Asia, could be turned into just another mainland city. So that's the cynical view. Uh, on the street, though, the young activists still, you know, it is good to, for Hong Kong that our activists are actually youngsters now. The old yeah, generation, generation. Of yeah, yeah, the older generation of activists who yeah. are now in their sixties and seventies, uh, you know, wouldn't be around to guard against these kinds so of things. So is it almost time for you to go back and go <laughs> full time and get involved again? Well, I stay involved as much as I can, but I think it's you know, I'm a foreign I was a foreign academic in Hong Kong for over thirty years, a local resident. But, you know, I think my world is the world of ideas, try to help people to understand things. During these protests, I've spent most of my time explaining what was going on to the international press. I came here and explained it to you a few times yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, appreciate that. So, so I think that's the kind of role I play, but I, I, I look with some hope to what these young, young activists are trying to do. And the only question in my mind, which I bring up, because I, I do shows on RTHK, the local public broadcaster, uh, frequently, I'm a regular on that, and I try, when I'm on there with pro-Beijing people, I actually point to them. I think if Hong Kong is to maintain its integrity and its autonomy, they have to try to explain why Hong Kong people are concerned about free speech, why yeah. they're concerned about yeah. the rule of law, and so on. They have to find their voice, and so far they haven't done that. They've been pandering to Beijing more because they get appointments and this and well, that. We have this to, we have to continue to have this yeah. conversation, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Michael Davis from Hong Kong University as a senior fellow and yeah. also Notre Dame, but uh, Jindal yeah. is where he's at most as well. Four months, four months, four months. Yeah, yeah? that's right. Thank so. you so much for coming down. We'll do this again, right? Very good. Aloha. Happy to. Thank you. <laughs>